Hi everyone, uh, we're very happy to be here. We are four uh, scholars who met at Cambridge. Three of us are PhD students at the Faculty of Education. One was a visiting scholar from Universidade Federal Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Uh, we are also part of a Latin American collective in Cambridge called CLAREC. And uh, we're very lucky to have here today uh, Dali, Professor Dalila Andrade Oliveira, who will be our discussant in our panel. And I will now pass the word to my colleague Rosil Fernandez Ogalde, who will start her presentation, Beyond Productive Labor and Embedded Production, Feminist Angles for Examining Teachers' Work and Accountability Policies. Rosil, the floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Well, um, hi everyone. I'm very happy to be in this panel with a woman that I admire and respect so much. Uh, my presentation today is titled Beyond Productive Labor and by Production Feminist Angle for Examining Teachers' Work. And basically, in this presentation, I will be stating the relevance of a labor perspective to understand teaching and to analyze education policy. And in particular, uh, feminist lens to do so. And I will be arguing uh, that teachers stand in a threefold position regarding labor. So, a bit of context. As we know, for many decades, there has been new and intensified pressures on teachers' work. Globally, in Latin America, in Chile, where I have conducted most of my work, and just a few days ago, it took place a rally from teachers and education from Florida who were denouncing the different attacks in their work. So, a uh, little to usually link these changes to accountability policies, right? Uh, and the few labor lenses available have been carried out mostly from a labor process perspective. Uh, however, while education policies keep adding pressure to teachers through accountability systems, there is a lack of conceptual resources around teachers' labor that can provide further understanding of this transformation. Specifically, on how uh, labor control and compliance are manufactured and secured. So, one of the problems in social sciences is that um, uh, imaginaries about work still rely a lot on industrial production of material goods and on an idea of capitalism as an equivalent of industrialization. So, attempts to see teaching as labor <coughs> and rely mostly on fixed categories that tend to miss key aspects of teaching or leave other aspects of sufficient So, is teaching a form of labor? <laughs> Uh, although the answer to this question might seem very obvious for people in this room, uh, there has been a tendency to disregard teaching as labor and teachers' condition as workers. In Latin America, this can be traced um, to the beginnings of the professions, first being to a missionary function and, um, and later to a national building role. Teaching was initially performed as an improvised activity with a scarce strength, and in this regard, teaching was viewed as a selfless or, uh, or an underpaid a uh, vocation or a sole profession. Dolina Martinez, Argentinian scholar and teacher unionist, stressed that teachers have to go through a lot of pain to, um, to researchers to visualize that in the school they were workers. She also suggested that in the past, educational sciences barely acknowledged the fact that teachers were workers. And she added another point. She said, this lack of recognition led to a lack of theorization and understanding of their everyday struggles. So, Labor process theory um, has offered valuable, however, limited contributions to do so. And this is a very, very complicated debate. Uh, people here will know about this. <laughs> um, because there's also three, or now we can talk about four ways of labor process theory, and each of these ways have been you know, like taking time to solve problems from the previous ways. ways. However, just to give an example of the problems of this, is that in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, there was a supposition that teachers were becoming more like industrial workers due to the downgrading of their skills and an increase in control. As Braverman suggested through his analysis of the critical sector, which was becoming much more prevalent. However, this kind of assumption missed two central aspects of proletarianization, so shall we get it? <laughs> which limited the explanatory power of uh, labor process theory. On the one side, the relational component of class, primarily founded in ownership over the means of production, which implies that not just fixed numbers, such as salaries, for instance, uh, should be looked um, when talking about proletarianization, <laughs> but most importantly, to set the, uh, the set of relations of exploitation that we come to a class. 
And on the other side, this opposition overlooked how the downgrading of features was related to transformations taking place in other workforce sectors and therefore to the compounding capitalist relations of production. However, there have been uh, some other contributions um, that have tried to address more nuanced aspect or more classical aspect of teaching as labor. Um, I don't have the time to explain all of them, but I'm just going to mention them. So first, uh, the recognition of the school growth uh, in social reproduction has been fundamental, and we can trace this back to Bon and Ginty's School in Capitalist America. Also, Ali Hotel's book, The Mana Chart, uh, which offers a much more nuanced perspective on labor, specifically by a focus on the commodification of emotions to the concept of emotional labor that she brought. Um, Third, care work, right? Feminist strand refers to care work to draw attention to household work and to unpaid labor or reproduction that is tied up for, the, for productive tasks, um, which help a lot to understand the intensification processes that were taking place uh, with teachers. Also, the new jobs resulting from the uh, new knowledge economy and the reorganization of the service industry also brought the concept of immaterial labor and non-material, non-classic forms of labor. And from this, also the concept of affective labor was used. Uh, in the case of teacher, affective labor has been employed to comprehend particular modes of control under high stakes and performance based accountability policies, uh, which emerged from specific contradictions faced by workers. So by connecting uh, lived experiences and teaching of certain structural conditionings, all these concepts shed light to essential aspects of the labor. However, uh, the isolated use of these lenses does not really seem to account for the, of the, the many, many um, continuous changes in teachers' teacher work. So, um, what could be a feminist lens in teachers' work, or teacher play? Um, to start this, we need to remember that the production of commodities is only one part of capitalist growth, right? Feminist scholars have shown that alongside capitalist production, there are social reproductive activities that are chronically undervalued, which allow for capital and capitalist subsistence, starting with the production of human beings, but also including activities that help to produce, uh, and I'm taking and quoting Nancy Fraser here, to help to produce new generations of workers and replenish existing ones, as well as to maintain social bonds and share meanings and understandings. So uh, Fraser argues that although these two spheres have experienced historical changes, they actually stand in a permanent contradiction that destabilize capitalist relations of existence. So basically, um, in, t- in its right for limitless accumulation, uh, capital needs to capitalize beyond the economy, specifically in the sphere of social reproduction. So by doing so, it threatens the conditions of its own existence. Elena Dionis work brings an additional insight to this. She says that, um, a, a very Marxist statement, but she really says it the same, uh, humans also produce themselves through work, right? As such, capitalist relations of production are simultaneously the reproduction of those capital relations. And she says that social reproductive activities are not just located in the arena of the extra economy, but this also operates in and through labor. So basically, while labor exploitation is what permits the production of commodities, it's labor disciplining what permits labor exploitation. So these two elements are intrinsically connected and reinforce each other. And to delve even further in this point, and I'm bringing in David Harvey here, we need to remember that capitalism is a totality, where value is in constant motion. So as capital circulates and moves to various stages, it can take different forms. So in order to realize value and to release it for future use, there has to be demand for the goods produced. People have to have money to buy those goods, which in turn have to be brought to market quickly enough so they are not divided. So taking this, then, the traditional notion of productive labor takes an incredibly narrow sense, right? And the divide between productive and unproductive labor just becomes a false dichotomy because these are both value generating in the sense that they take part in some, in some of the circuits of value creation. Uh, and a similar uh, reductive understanding takes place when looking at traditional notions of labor control. So because of the I- interdependent relationship between production and social reproduction, labor disciplining occurs in many living spaces and across the labor process. 
So following uh, Baglioni, workers cannot reproduce themselves regardless of the reproduction of capital. And this is very important to take um, in consideration. And from this, I argue then that teachers stand in a fearful position regarding me. I don't know what to add in this time. Okay. Um, so, first, and contrary to the tendency to view teaching, regardless of a labor category, teachers wrote in replenishing new generations of workers pushes us to think of the work in relation to other forms of labor. The reorganization and remodeling of the labor force resulting from the new economies impacts the reorganization of the entire educational system, and we need that the sort of skills, knowledge, and abilities that educational levels should produce. So in addition, society's larger concerns usually translate into demands for teachers, right? Inclusion, cohesion, sustainability, innovation, and so on. But this role also entails mediating needs, desires, aspirations, and means that sustain social bonds and human needs. Second, and as for any other work uh, and worker, teachers' labor regime is based on labor discipline within and beyond the school and the educational system. So teachers are workers and fabricated, teachers as, as workers as, are fabricated in the same way. Uh, they are a product of other previous and present current relationship and differences and social relations constituting teachers can be reproduced through the workplace. Because after all, reproduction is always at the core of the modes in which work is organized and experienced. Third, and under the current commodification of education, teachers also produce in the classical sense uh, in which they take part in the production of education. And here we can think about for profit schools, but we can also think about uh, value added models, which try to kind of measure how much value a teacher uh, can add to the overall production of education. So, uh, and I'm gonna finish with this final part. Uh, why and oh, how can these lenses enable us to see in terms of policy analysis for teacher policies? Um, so I didn't mention this because it's a lot of work, but uh, this is based on my PhD where I conducted political policy analysis, so you have to trust me when, <laughs> when I'm kind of um, stating this. We can talk about this later, but for now just trust. <laughs> um, so I argue that there has been a strategic disconnection and overlapping of teacher labor processes and regimes. So basically, over these years, policy organizing and controlling teacher and teaching although very different in these 40 years, are tied by a disconnection and overlapping of the reproductive and productive spheres. So for instance, uh, I'm gonna read this excerpt from a media uh, newspaper. So this decree has meant excessive workload for the teachers who had to create a vast number of highly complex notebooks. This exceeded the capacity of the existing human resources and the infrastructures of most educational institutions. This prevented teachers from performing other duties sometimes more crucial with the necessary progress. So actually, this quote that we can think the care about the working conditions is, a, is from the dictatorship, right? It's from 1980, from the school. And this other quotation, what that says, although some of the teachers who took the microphone complained about workload overload and indicated that the ministry can be seen as an obstacle, the minister also received applause. So they are like, not really caring about the working conditions, and this is a quotation from a much recent um, uh, newspaper. News, so, uh, also, all of these connections and overlap between these both social reproduction of the routine here take place particularly in Chile in the 90s, uh, where there are more intensified overlaps. So, there was a clash with an occupation oriented by social justice aims, educational, educator, social missions and go as a state being less conflicted as they were now working for, for, profit, for profit actors. Social status declined further of teachers, uh, the authority was undermined even more, and identities as knowledge production was heavily undermined. This is not something I'm saying like, many people, many researchers in Chile have said this. However, my point is that this has not just directed at the self or a teacher's identities, but this holds a conflicted presence in the policy domain. And I'm gonna, for the discussion. Okay, so, um, concluding remarks. First of all, making visible the unseen, right, the name of the planet. Labor regimes, as the wider circuit and arrangement were labor process, of course, allow us to see, to see the contradictions that are taking place. So first of all, teacher labor policies go beyond teacher policy. Teacher, yeah, 
the labor policy will be young, but what the policy declares as a future policy. Also, when it comes to teaching, social reproduction and production intersect and overlap in a unique form that helps to expose the interplay between both spheres more, more than in other forms of work. So these can be highly contradictory sometimes, but therefore allow us to first see the inner contradictions within capitalism, and also, uh, to some extent, trace and connect potential alliances um, and struggles that might feel disconnected, but actually are very much connected because of this. And this can bring, therefore, uh, implications for work control, compliance, and resistance, and lead to teachers' work. To, this presentation is based on my PhD project, um, which aims to understand the privatization in an application as embedded within broader discussions of citizenship, exclusion, inclusion, and equality in the case of rural and white. Um, this is very um, much a work in progress, so <coughs> as I'm conducting my field work right now, so any feedback or suggestion is very much welcome. Uh, for this presentation, I will focus on the theoretical, methodological, and historical lenses and provide an example of why, what do I mean by uh, localizing and historicizing the analysis of private education. I've worked on the research of private education for a while now, and when I embarked into the long-term PhD journey, I realized that uh, there were other lenses that I needed to look into for um, understanding this phenomenon, specifically in the context where I come from, which is Peru. So I started by um, trying to understand or see uh, what is the critical analysis of education so far. So the literature on the privatization of education has, has advanced nuanced understanding and critical understandings of this phenomenon. Uh, however, it has a tendency. First, that it tends to pose this phenomenon in relation to a Western Keynesian welfare state that secured uh, public or common education for all. And then that also mo most of the literature, not all of it, of course, there are exceptions, focuses on the growth of privatization and its the global neoliberal turn in the last 30 years. And also then it links the, this the manifestation of privatization related to the commercialization and marketization. On the other hand, scholars have also argued that porousness between and within the categories of the public and the private, right? Like, for example, the famous uh, Walden Trudel's um, understanding of exogenous and endogenous privatization or the quirky privatization that is like how it's inserting in the public sphere, its hidden nature, and how it has like these growing blurred boundaries between what is public and private. In recent years, also new scholars have uh, tried to understand new categorizations of these uh, boundaries that account for the complexity of it and like kind of criticize the binary of like these two spheres. However, in post-colonial contexts such as Latin America, certain historical structures are crucial crucial to dialogue with these notions. First, um, that there is has been like the state and the public in general, has been based on an exclusion, based on, uh, has excluded a large part of the population based on class, race, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender. And in that sense, uh, the notion of the public has been private in a way or the other. Several authors have talked about this. Gerrard, for example, talks about the idealization we have made of public education with the case of Australia in mind, for example. Uh, Edwards and others have talked about the ethos of privatization in the case of the Honduran state. 
and Kihana, of course, and Julio Kotler have talked about the private nature of public office in the case of Peru. Uh, so this is a very important point that I'm going to talk about further on. And on the other hand, in Latin America, uh, education began, I mean, maybe other countries, most countries, began as a private endeavor uh, to the Catholic Church, which had like a double mission, right? Like a religious instruction and uh, civilizing the local population. So this idea has challenged some assumptions made in the literature. First, that the notion that public education is entirely public or common, to which the growth of privatization uh, in the last century is opposed to. And then that the blurring boundaries are a process that have, has exacerbated and like, created in the neoliberal era. Actually, if we think about it this way, um, it's, it, they were part of the structure and construction of the public to begin with uh, in this context. So I really like this quote by Gillian Hart. Here she talks a little bit about um, kind of like this idea, right? She says, our efforts to remake the future depend crucially on how we remember and forget the past, and on how it has taken a huge dose of official amnesia to render the new liberal project palatable. By reconstructing dimensions of local histories and source local connections, we were disrupting elements of this amnesia. So what do I mean by localizing and historicizing? I mean that it's important to analyze the previous manifestations of privatization to comprehend how the neoliberal project builds on and conflicts with and gets into tension with previous forms of lo local social structures and exclusion, right? It's not that it's only to understand the past by itself, but it's like to link it and see what is being pulled uh, to the present as well. So these legacies of enclosure and exclusion are what the new forms of privatization adapt and thrive on. This lens allows us to uh, like to expand a few theoretical and methodological understandings of privatization. First, to expand the concept of privatization beyond marketized relations, accounting for its links to historical legacies of enclosure and differentiation and understanding of the cultural and social dimensions of it. Of course, as Anna's Rocio mentioned, is without like this social link trying to understand that it's all part of a totality, right? It's not that they are separate, they are intertwined and part of a, of a totality. Then, but it also uh, helps us understand, visualize the various institutions and actors involved in the privatization of education that are uh, being blurred if we see it as a whole, as a whole point linked to marketization, such as the Catholic Church, for example, which we know has a major importance in Latin America and very much linked to how neoliberalism has been um, linked to, to religion as well. For example, in Peru, we find that uh, the Catholic and evangelical churches has used private schools to advance the anti-women's agenda, and like sometimes like taking students to marches, and so like there is a link there that is important to understand as well. Uh, and well, like the church uh, also linked to the other um, populations in Latin America. Then these lessons also allows us allow us to acknowledge that private education can sometimes serve a public role in this context. So um, we can debate whether what does this public role means, what are the limits of it, or how private providers use this to advance uh, market, the market. But if we have to acknowledge that in contexts where the state has in absence, specifically in certain territories, private providers or private education has uh, served as a form of public role, right? Like, and we, it's important to, to debate or, or see behind what does this mean in different localities and historical moments. And then finally, it also allows us to account the relationship between privatization and coloniality, which I will explain in a bit. So, the figure of privatization as enclosure is something that it has, in, has come in handy uh, to kind of like include all of these things I've been mentioning. Um, Marxist scholars have talked about the enclosures of economies as a crucial part of the birth of capitalism, but also its reproduction. And by this, is mean, this they mean like the, the enclosure of the legal and um, physical, almost violence at some points, enclosure of lands and resources. And uh, later on, also, feminist and black Nazi scholars have broadened this concept to include the restriction not only of the lands and resources, but also of women's bodies, right? That was crucial for the birth and reproduction of capitalism, uh, which were appropriated and controlled uh, for the sake of capitalism. <coughs> So these ideas, like this kind of like rupture of the notion of enclosure, can help us understand that enclosures can occur on different scales, on both material and symbolic spaces, uh, going through social relations and bodies. And understanding privatization as enclosure uh, helps us understand 
like highlights the borders that are being imposed uh, around which is that around that which is confined. Who is setting those borders? Who is left outside of them? And who are this? And how these borders are sometimes resist resistant? Um, so education privatization as a form of enclosure uh, of, so I understand in, the, in my project uh, as a form of a enclosure of social relations and of knowledge, which is also intersected by race, race, class, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender, right? Uh, so, so, Robertson, so Robertson has talked about like how in higher education, uh, also privatization is like a mind grabber, kind of like with the idea of like land grabber, because it takes over also like how we think, the, the ways of seeing of, of the world that we have into hand, right? And I see this especially important in the case of elementary and secondary education. So, uh, this is, these are two pictures of Lima. You can see of Lima, where my project is on. It's kind of like self-explanatory. The first picture, it's called public beach, private beach. And so like it has a border between these two spaces that are uh, not only kind of like the notion of econ economically divided, there are a lot of social, cultural ideas around who is allowed in one space or the other. Um, so this brings into mind that the notion of enclosure is also very much linked to border making and to symbolic and material spaces. Um, and this is where the concept of other income seem as important. Uh, here I argue that privatization has grown as uh, others have entered public spaces, right? In the case of Peru, for example, with the waves of immigration from, especially from indigenous communities, the processes of privatization grew in the 20th and 21st century, right? And the fact that privatization grows when the public sphere is uh, encountered by others shows that the public wasn't common or public to begin with. Okay, so here I want to give an example uh, to why looking at the past can help us understand uh, the present and help us understand how education, of the last manifestation of educational privatization works. So, okay, foreign and Western imaginaries have shaped the private education landscape uh, in the last centuries with different actors, institutions, and decent places in mind over time according to the global power of like, in the, in the, like the global changes in global power. So of course we know like in the 16th, 18th century was the Catholic Church, the Spanish crown, um, that not only brought private education but also included white supremacy within um, education policy with like in the 18th century regulations that allowed um, creators of private schools and teachers to be honest of us and of clean blood, for example. Then in the 20th century, in the early and mid 20th century, this is linked to the, to the straight project of attracting European immigration uh, like um, foreign, especially European, Western communities um, were attracted to the, to, as a racial leveler, we've heard about this in the case of Latin America and several countries, um, came, to the, came to Peru and weren't included in the public sector but created these close communities of international private schools, which were first uh, for the upper class and also lower class students, but that then became an aspiration for the emerging middle class. And here, ideas of modernity were very much linked to foreign private education and the notion of whiteness. Uh, later on, uh, the state, especially the military governments in the mid to late 90s, attempted to kind of regulate these foreign imaginaries uh, through um, policies that kind of like, for example, uh, prohibited the use of foreign languages, names, foreign language names in private education, or um, banned principles like require principals to be Peruvian, for example, or ban the use of English in nursery schools, and so on, right? This were dismantled with the years, but this was like an, an attempt to try to kind of like regulate this notion of national identity um, through private education. And then in the last time, like we, like in the, like in the final, like in the last 30 years, there has been a growth uh, of private education through what is called uh, a process of default privatization with very low regulation and a bottom-up construction of private schools, and it's the 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 mark, like the the the, the private education sector is very segmented and socioeconomically segregated, segregated, as we can see like in this graphic here, where it's like national or public schools and then like both like the low fee private schools, uh, middle fee private schools, and then very high end. Um, so okay, 
We've talked about like the influence of like foreign imaginaries, especially Western imaginaries and, white, and whiteness in private education. But what happens now? Here, this is just an exercise where I, where I categorize the names of private schools in Lima, which were around 9,700, according to the language and the cultural special imaginaries they refer to. So I found that a third of the schools have names that refer to Spanish and applied cultural preferences. Another third uh, that refer to US or UK or European references. And then 14% that were around like Peruvian, right? And what is interesting is that despite uh, this being uh, an, an element or a characteristic from the 20th or 21st century, the market right now also uses uh, these imaginaries in, in the different level, in the different fee ranges, right? It's they are it's present in the high um, high fee uh, private schools, but also in the middle fee and in the low fee private schools. Some of these low fee private schools, for example, only include names such as schools or academies or institutions in their names. And of course, we can always say that it's not that they're, they are actually bringing a foreign project uh, or educational project, but it's what they are aspiring to or what they are trying to portray through their, through their names. Here there are some pictures, for example, and a, a, a school called Cambridge, for example, in, in Lima, or university school, these sort of names. So the presence of Western references, um, especially from the US, UK, and Europe, in Peruvian public education suggests that this continues to be a key element in shaping today, today's educational market. These are present across different educational levels and fee ranges as we mentioned. And this high aspiration for private education has been mostly studied um, if by scholars to ideas of quality or security or social mobility and entrepreneurship, right? right. And these are all, all true. But it is also closely intertwined with private schools representation of a modernizing project linked to foreign and Western values and whiteness. And this is an element that hasn't been studied in how the private education sector works in Peru and other, and other uh, countries of Latin America. So here again, making visible the unseen, um, the idea of looking into locality, the specificity of locality and having a, spa a spatial lens, and also uh, including an analysis of historical legacies when looking into the privatization of education, sheds lights on new elements to understand current manifestations at local, regional, and global levels. I think this can help us understand the co a new conceptualization of, of privatization, not only useful for the global south, or like Peru, or Latin America, but also to understand how it's working in other contexts. And here it's very important to, to include a lens and the intersection of race, class, ethnicity, and sexuality, and gender in the shaping of the different iterations of private education. As the new forms of privatization, as I was mentioning before, adapt to and thrive on these legacies of enclosure and exclusion. And in this case, uh, with this example, I was talking about how historical remnants of coloniality and depreciation intersect with capitalism. So I'm going to end there. And yeah, this is just like the steps moving forward. I won't talk about this now, but this is like part of my future project. I'm like, kind of like the things I want to see with my cadre analysis and introduce, uh, but yeah. Additionally, my study is informed by the lived experiences of their mothers. I will start this presentation by telling you a bit about who I am and where I stand in relation to my study. I am a 45-year-old woman. 
children, uh, student parent who went back to university after a period of being a full-time mother. Before that, I had a corporate career in Brazil and in the UK where my children were born. We have been living in the UK for more than a decade now, and in times of Brexit, I was targeted in a hate campaign from people who believed I was not entitled to live in their country. My own experiences of belonging as a university student, as well as in life in general, in very different places and times are complex and sometimes opposed to each other. <coughs> what does it mean to belong? Uh, my research dives into this question, drawing from Heidegger's insights and being in time. He suggests that belonging in its broadest existential sense is about being in the world. This implies that belonging is as diverse as people's lives and experiences. I also explore Belhoof's idea of belonging as a culture of place, a geography of the heart. For the women I'm studying, um, who navigate elite universities, belonging is a mix of these tangible places, uh, the university and the home, as well as their minds and hearts. It's a complex interplay between where and when they are and how they feel. I also draw on Avatar Bra concept of diasporic space when exploring the experiences of our everyday bordering of underrepresented women at elite universities. Yuval Davis highlights the importance of diasporic spaces because it is the ultimate space in which intersectional otherness and differences as well as similarities can come together. Adding that the most important aspect of diasporic spaces is their potential to decentralize hegemonic centers of power. Spaces of belonging and togetherness are key in my research to understand how these women in diasporic spaces are potentially fostering solidarity and reshaping traditional power structures for themselves and for the benefit of future generations studying at elite universities. Uh, this is a qualitative study of mothers and daughters. I'm conducting separate semi-structured in-depth interviews with women, first-generation university students, which I call the daughters, and their mothers. Questions center on the daughter's sense of belonging during their undergraduate studies, as well as the educational and employment journeys of both mothers and daughters and mother and daughter relationships. My methodology is also rooted in the concept of intertwined memories, which, is, which I developed during my master's research and which is crucial to my understanding of intergenerational inequalities. My concept of intertwined memories uh, builds on Hirsch post memory theory adapted to the context uh, of trauma associated with experiences of extreme poverty of the mothers in Brazil to illust illustrate how daughters as first generation university students carry their mother's traumas in their lives. This fuels their journeys towards a better life, not just for themselves, but also to do justice for their mothers, who on the other hand have empowered their daughters through all their lives, dreaming that they would have a better life. Then, when daughters break vicious generational cycles by accessing higher education for the first time, uh, their achievements and empowerment journey are shared with their mothers, initiating a healing process for both. A degree brings possibilities of a better material access, well-being, and mental health, uh, paving the way for a better start for the next generation in material terms, but also in the sense that they will carry and share less trauma. I will try to provide you with a brief overview of recent changes that have been reshaping the demographics of student intake at elite universities in Brazil and in the UK in recent years. In Brazil, the majority of the population is black and brown, whereas the UK is characterized as primarily white, a primarily white nation, with 18% of the population identifying as being black, Asian, and minority ethnic. I employ different terminologies here, uh, reflecting each country's classifications for national census, with Brazil using phenotype-based categories and the UK employing ethnicity-based classifications. In both countries, the majority of children attend state schools. However, students admitted to top universities historically come from a selected few who received private education. What has changed in the 21st century? In Brazil, public universities introduced affirmative action programs aiming to increase representation of non-white and state school students since the early 2000s, sparking a national debate. This led to the passing of a law in 2012 introducing a quota system in all federally funded universities 
universities, reserving 50% of all undergraduate places for state school students, with half allocated to low income and the other half to black, brown, or indigenous students. However, this law does not apply to state-funded universities, notably the very top ones, including Unicum. These universities designed their own affirmative action programs later in time, uh, including a much less ambitious quota system. In, con oh, sorry. <laughs> in contrast, the UK lacks such legislation or a social racial quota system. Instead, public universities <coughs> were required to enhance diversity within their student admissions when they shifted from flat to variable tuition fees in 2006. Access participation plans and outreach programs were outlined in access agreements negotiated between universities and the government body regulating higher education. The specific targets are primarily based on a single indicator, the intake of state school students. However, this can be misleading as data has shown that state school students accepted by top universities uh, typically come from a relatively small number of independent and selective grammar schools and six form colleges. Nevertheless, this this brought in state school students who otherwise would unlikely have a place uh, at Cambridge, including the participants of my study. In fact, only today I saw in the news that Cambridge is actually dropping out of their next access agreement, targets for state school students, putting at risk the recently achieved progress. In Brazil, these programs resulted in black and brown students becoming the majority uh, within public universities for the first time in 2018. Unicamp in particular saw a 91% increase in admissions of black, brown, and indigenous students after the introduction of its racial quota system in 2017. <coughs> Similarly, Cambridge showed record numbers of state school and BAME students with record size have record highs in every year between 2017 and 23. What I aim to introduce with my research is a shift in focus from diversity to belonging, exploring how these record numbers of students feel being in the world of uh, higher education in elite spaces, which by the very definition of elite are spaces historically built upon their exclusion. And why mothers and daughters? Uh, this is a work file showing the occupations of the mothers and grandmothers of my participants who are first generation university students. So far, all mothers who are first generation, uh, all participants, uh, sorry, so far all mothers have mainly been engaged in various forms of care work, both paid and unpaid. I want to understand if these patterns in occupations typically undertaken by women are disrupted or not when daughters are the first generation of women in their families to have access to higher education. This is a brief profile of the mothers and daughters who, part, uh, who participated in my research so far. The daughters hold degrees in various fields, including history, computer science, civil engineering, education, social sciences, veterinary science, and medieval studies. They are currently employed in roles related to their resp respective fields, and two are still undergraduates. I will conclude my presentation by sharing some preliminary uh, themes that emerged from my participants with some quotations from their interviews. I won't have the time to share my analysis today, but what I aim to present in the short time I have is, are some thoughts inspired by the lived experience of my participants. The first, the first theme revolves around women's care responsibilities within the home and how they are passed, passed over from one generation to the other. One Brazilian mother said that she became a full-time mother because her, my husband used to say, oh, but you didn't study, are you going to work to take care of others? So I stayed at home and take care of the children because otherwise I would have to pay, I would have to pay some to do that. This other one is from a daughter from Brazil who began her studies during the pandemic. She told me this, so when I got uh, the pandemic, I stayed at home for a long time. I think that made my mom a little happier because she didn't have to she could go to work and I would stay home with my little brother. My brother at home and he wanted to watch cartoons on my computer, which was the only screen they had in the house. And I was, okay, watch. So I took fewer subjects, fewer credits, and I got my degree delayed a little bit. Her studies were actually delayed by about a year. And when I met her, her peers were already graduating, but still she had a one year. 
I will share a brief video clip from the film Southport, not that one, before we go on to the next theme. The movie set at Oxford University and the men in the scene are wearing tuxedos for a university party. One of them comes from an affluent family with his mother also being a former, former student at Cambridge and Oxford. Many of my participants have made different degrees of effort to fit in into their elite university environment. One daughter from Brazil recalled her experience at, at her graduation party. She says, you see everyone very well dressed with all their family with their support, right? I didn't feel very comfortable in that place. You know how I felt? Very out of place. If I felt for a moment like I was well dressed, others would be much better dressed than me. A Cambridge participant told me, I definitely, felt, I definitely felt like I had to pretend that I, had a uh, that I was a little bit posher than I was. For the first few weeks, I was very much like I had to speak nicely and maybe portray myself because I have a bit more money. Another Cambridge participant coming from a poor rural area in Ireland told me this about her Irish accent. When I go home, people were like, you sound more English, but I'm not conscious of that. If I could change it, accent, I probably would sometimes because it's, you know, people can stop pretending not to understand what you're saying. She added that I make an effort to have the words I want to say beforehand because, because it's then in the correct language to try and show that I can keep up with the academic side. So clearly from these quotes from my participants, there is a constant reminder that to belong, they need to catch up in a variety of ways. However, despite their efforts, they often feel like they're not quite there yet. They're almost passing. That's all. Uh, if you want to learn more about my master's <coughs> research on mothers and daughters and intertwined memories, you can see more in my book. And I am discussing here some of my unpublished work today. I would appreciate it if you reference this presentation in case you find it useful in your work. Thank you. She will join us remotely uh, and present her research on civic military schools in Brazil as patriarchal white supremacist and queerphobic project. Let's just see. Thank you, Bruna. Bruna. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Viva Bruna! Viva Bruna! Great friends and my colleagues and 
and take an honor to take this moment with you all and to have you as our success in the Midwest. So the work I'm presenting today is a segment of a program research coordinated by my colleague Fiona Lima, who couldn't be here today. We're members of the Political Pages, a group dedicated to investigate conservative movements in Brazilian education. And today, specifically, we will be dis discussing the civil military schools of Brazil under feminist lenses. And our project is called the Conservative Alliance to State and Educational Policies in Brazil. And we started mapping conservative agents involved in policies such as the nonpartisan school, homeschooling, and the militarization of public schools. And recently, we have been analyzing the discourses used by the active agents to defend their agendas. So through thematic analysis and relational analysis, we examined over 200 speech and post fragments and identified 11 main arguments. These include the family's centrality in educational decisions, accusations of ideological and gender indoctrination, and an alleged persecution of Christians which are arguments often used to justify authoritarian and exclusionary educational policies. When discussing the defense of militarization specifically, the arguments can show some particularities, but before discussing it, I'll briefly present this policy to you. So the national program of civic military schools, also known as the team, was established by decree in 2019 during Bolsonaro's presidency. And these are non-militarized schools managed by retired military agents. Although the team lacks a specific pedagogical plan, conservatives praise, praise that as a way to improve safety, neutrality, and quality of education. According to Bolsonaro himself, these are features that were lost because of the democratization of education. And despite Lula revoking the decree in 2017, civic military schools can still exist and expand its local authorities desired to. <coughs> so in our research, the speakers specifically related to the militarization of public schools were identified under things such as discipline, patriotism, and citizen safety and fighting ideological indoctrination. At the same time, despite the conservative discourse having a strong appeal in convincing the implementation of the policy, neoliberal arguments are also very present. So examples of that would were find found in speeches such as liberty, equality, and national development. These reflect the concept of conservative modernization and education. While hegemonic alliances that is located for traditional conservative values, they also promote the modernization of education in liberal terms. Here we have an example of a speech from Bruno Engler, a right-wing state deputy. He argues that public schools lack discipline and need an experienced criminal incident, which puts them in no good condition to create a proper environment for learning. The proposal is then to transfer their management to military police. Here you can see three of the arguments being used. Discipline and safety in the sense that school has not been success successful in controlling students. And quality in education as a way of saying that hierarchy and order would be <coughs> necessary to, to provide a safe space for good teaching and better results. All of these arguments that have connected uh, to common sense and the real insecurities of people. Throughout our analysis, it caught our attention that despite the anti-gender and anti-feminist agenda has been central to conservative movements worldwide, it does not appear as a primary plan in the militarization of public schools. It did appear in a few of these speeches, such as this one by Eduardo Bolsonaro, who is Bolsonaro's son and a very popular federal deputy. He says that all parents would like to put their children in the hands of military agents because they know there will be no teaching sex in their day nor street. Despite this example mobilizing explicitly the gender ideology narrative, we identify that this is an argument <coughs> exceptionally in the test of militarization. And because of that, we sought stimulus lenses to analyze the movement seeking to bring to the surface what often lies in 
So if we go back to Bruno Magnus, for example, what questions can we make through intersectional feminist lenses? When he said that public schools lack discipline and that crimes occur in them, which bodies are the protagonists of these experiences and that need to be disciplined? When he addresses a proper environment for learning, what is that he has in mind? The student body of public schools in Brazil is mostly made of lower class black children and youth. So disguised as a concern with quality, order, and discipline, lies an understanding that these are the students who should know their places. Brazilian black feminists have consistently highlighted the deep connection between society, sexism, and racism. I cite here the influential work of figures like Lélia Gonzalez and Cida Bento, who challenged the myth of racial democracy in Brazil. They shall light on the burden experience, particularly by black women and gender race and class intersect. Black individuals, especially black women, are often dehumanized by whiteness, trapped within images of control, as the Patricia Mubal is present and we understand that the effect of this has seen follow this tendency. So you can see this anti-feminist and anti-black ways in statements like this from Zerem Zau, former Minister, Minister of Education under Bolsonaro. He said that the Pestin is about bringing back what's been lost. So he said, ugly stays ugly, beautiful stays beautiful. Right is right and wrong is wrong. That's about bringing back respect for teachers, parents, saying no to graffiti, vandalism, and destroying public property. But when he mentions saying no to graffiti, we can see white supremacy being triggered. He dismisses graffiti artistic and social value by linking it to, with vandalism. He denies the recognition owed to its creator, who are, to its creator sorry, who are usually from black and marginalized communities. Similarly, his assertion that what is ugly remains ugly taps into the notion of an idyllic past. Brazil has been witnessing significant grassroots movements for black feminist and free rights, and privileged groups have been feeling displaced or bombed. They argue that society has deviated from its moral concept, labeling those who embrace their identity as deviant. In this sense, a black girl who fights to escape the social images of control is intolerable and must be disciplined and domesticated. That can be read as one of the underlying goals of projects such as this. The policies, rules of conduct are extremely strict and include uniforms, clothing, and classes of citizens. Clothing, hairstyles, and uh, the expression of political ideas are expected to be standardized or even silenced. As a result, we have been seeing multiple cases of students being prevented, prevented from attending classes in these institutions. These students that are target, targeted with these schools have many aspects in common, usually racial, gender, sexual, and cultural ones. So these are attacks to diversity and identity expression such as the prohibition of different hairstyles, the use of religious attire and accessories. We can actually say we have been witnessing numerous cases of discrimination and violence in the name of discipline and quality of education. So, so in an overview, we can understand that civil military schools get a dangerous ongoing project specifically because Besides not having training as educators, many military agents who have been inserted into school spaces are in fact abusers. Both the rules of conduct and the military's practices have constituted attacks on self-esteem of black students and the silencing of their own blackness. We also reinforce what we already knew by signaling that military dynamics are neither educational nor democratic. But we re recognize even more that there is a legacy of the military dictatorship, which occurred both in Brazil and in other Latin American countries, and which we know was especially cruel towards women and free people. 
in this we see the military dynamics in schools as an attempt to update a region of patriarchal places and fear poverty control over you. It is an exclusionary, authoritarian, and ultimately also criminal project. Although there is still much to be said about this program and its impact not only on the students but also on educators, I wanted to finish by highlighting the importance of using intersectional feminist lenses to conduct the educational analysis. The feminist scientific production and establishment of network effective cyber resistance since they produce powerful perspectives to think about and fight against conservative movements. We're starting a new phase of the Conservative Alliances project, comparing educational systems in Brazil, Chile, and the US, because we all have noticed similarities pointing to a transnational power of white conservatives, <coughs> especially regarding anti-gender agendas, which I have been working with Professor Kathy Moller, who I know is there too, and while it is not the main place for of militarization, feminist perspectives reveal its underlying racist and patriarchal nature, which aim to restore an idyllic and anti-democratic past. So we've been exploring Latin America and its unique features, like military dictatorships and its impact on education today, to grasp to grasp our context better as well as to widen understandings of global education. Intersectional feminisms are an imperative to present these reflections and in our opinion. For now, this, this is, I'm open to this conversation. I thank you very, very much for the attention. to join this, the, this interesting panel uh, that is discussing. I apologize, but I will read my comments. The, the panel brings together very thought-provoking works, which bring a new approach, of, uh, uh, approach to old but urgent problems. The confluence of this table is the adoption of a feminist approach to understand the educa education problems, which links different research in addition to the fact that it deals with analysis of the reality of Latin American countries. To a certain extent, knowledge produced by South and to the South. Starting with Rocio's paper, Rocio's paper we see that she starts from the observation that there is a lack of conceptual resource around the work, the work of teachers that can provide a more in-depth in -depth understanding of the production of labor control and compliance. According to her, most attempts to analyze teaching as work to, to date have been based on fixes fixed categories that tend to ignore key aspects of teaching, such as its inherent functions of care and social productions, production and other aspects. We know that our education systems in Latin America have suffered and still suffer strong influences from the Euro European model. In the same way, European theoretical influences, even in the critical field, are very strong with us, which explains why for decades analysis of teaching works in, the, in that region showed a gap in relation to our problems and context. The emergence of Strata network, Strata, came precisely from this observation. She proposed to analyze the teacher accountability policies implemented in Chile, 
seeking to demonstrate that feminist angles allow, allow us to advance this understanding. In this sense, she highlights that there is a tendency to dis disregard, disregard each other's work and the conditions of each other's work added to the fact that in, in knowledge economics, the framework of good teachers has been strong <coughs> design into indicators that, that aim to test the teacher's success in developing cognitive skills as observed in Thales and, and other skills. Rocio maintain, maintains that it is necessary to overcome this analysis and insist on the understand of teachings as a known a non classical form of work, highlighting, among others, the contributions of feminist strength that refer to care work, drawing attention to domestic work and unpaid reproductive work that is crucial to, to productive, productive tasks. In addition, tasks in the domain of health, nutrition, and well-being, such as scary activities that have always tended to be obscured. In this aspect, I want to highlight the importance of the pandemic context to shed light of this reality. Women were even more penalized by the demands of care in reproduction of the workforce of workforce during the pandemic. Several studies in different national contexts have demonstrated this. Ocio proposes a feminist lens for the analysis of teaching work and seeks to, to do the strong reference authors. Focus in her empirical work on the Chilean context through the analysis of the discourses emitted by the journal El Mercurio from the dictatorship of Chile to the present day. And it is here that Rocio's work meets that of Bruna and Diana, who propose to produce an analysis that <coughs> seeks to make visible, 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 I don't know, visible, the exclusion exclusionary aspects underlying the militarization of Brazilian public schools, which manifest themselves in patriarchal ideologies of white supremacy and care for good, using interse intersectional, intersectional feminist theoretical and methodological tools. They propose in the thesis Military, military schools program in Brazil during the Bolsonaro government. They demonstrate how the program supports conservative advancement in the Brazilian educational context through the infiltration of military agents into school space, promising discipline and resource to improve the structure and the materials of schools. At the same time that they highlight the contradictions within the conservative discourse that defends the improvement of educational quality with sexist, anti-feminist, racist, and um, carephobic ideals and prejudices. As we know, this program arises in a political context of reaction to advances in social policies after more than a decade of popular democratic government in Brazil, in which underrepresented groups conquered spaces never occupied. In the educational sector, the achievement of the national education plan especially the document resulting from the 2010 National Education Conference, materializes these achievements and proposes them, them as a state policy. The, the authors 
identified in this conservative reaction, the creation of an anti-gender, anti-feminist alliance in the national political context, political context that targets teachers. In the face of concern about an alleged contamination in the education of children and adolescents, in which they could be vulnerable to educators who persist in subverting their family's values. What the authors demonstrate is that although anti gender discourse is not explicitly included in the arguments used to defend the city from military school, the documents that regulate this institution as well as the implementation of the dressing program make clear the defense of patriarchal values of a white supremacy. In the sense, they highlight contribution from black Brazilian feminist, fe, feminists who have historically, historically denounced the deep connection of Brazilian society and culture with sexism and racism. The myth of a racial, racial democracy was dismantled by them, along with the necessary understanding of the particularly vulnerable position in which black women, women uh, are placed when gender, race, and class dynamic compete. As an example, they cite the fact that black girls were prevented from attending classes in civic military schools because their hair was not combed account according to the institution's rules. The authors emphasize that the, milita the militarization of public schools excuses a legacy of patriarchal, homophobic, racist and misogynistic violence left by the military dictatorship of the years 1964 and 1985 in Brazil. They remember that this dictatorship was especially cruel towards women. And I want to remind that this same conservatives use the cruelty in two different historical moments with the same woman, John Rousseff, who, de, who died to criticize the dictatorship, and for that reason, she was arrested and tortured. And then, because she once again dared to be president of the Republic, and was, and was the victim of a it, it is when this study brings the focus of the condition of this poor black woman that we find a link between, uh, between it and the studies of Ana Maria, who proposed to explore the, to explore the feeling of belonging of first generation university students at a elite universities in Brazil and in the UK. She includes the perspective of these students' mother with the aim of adopting an inter intergenerational approach to understand access and inequality through and lived experiences and educational path of these women. The main focus of the research is the parallel experience of both countries, which are undergo undergoing a transformation in the, demo the, the demographies of the students in elite higher education institutions, intended to deepen the understanding of how this change were facilitated, facilitated through public policies, especially the systems of quotas in Brazil and access agree agreements in the UK. She sets out of as a mind how this below impacts the lives of the lives of underrepresented students who study 
at a private institutions. What else, ne what else needs to change for this new and diverse group of undergraduate students to belong to top universities? These and other questions can mobilize, mobilize our debate here and launch, uh, and launch ideas for new explorations. Due the time limit and the complexity of the talk, I would leave here some questions for us to continue reflecting and debating. Why have we only started to ask our, ourselves this question so recently? Why has the, the gender ag agenda is in, uh, in educational and research been so little value in our studies in Latin American countries, even though we have long known that the devaluation of the teacher profession is directly related to gender. Finally, I would like to say that I understand that our condition as Latin American women, women but <laughs> with a, a while a white majority part, uh, participate, participate, participate in a high level academic event, the CIS in the United States, bring these topics to the debate is a powerful strategy to affirm our condition. However, our condition still differ from, from that of our fellow black women who, as bell hooks and others, so well show, show it, suffer even more from this discrimination and do not always enjoy the same opportunities that we have. Thanks again. Very organic in how to manage this, so please just yeah. try to have a conversation. Yeah. Thank you very much for what you No, go ahead. <laughs> 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 I can call. Yeah, want to talk there also. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting presentation. I would like to uh, make just a comment and question related to the civic military schools because I saw, uh, um, in my opinion, a you know, dangerous parallel with uh, something that has happened in Europe. Uh, I'm uh, from, from Europe. Uh, that in Hungary, um, it has been deployed uh, with the same uh, logic of having former military people uh, acting as guards, um, a sort of a school guard in the public schools in marginalized areas. And in that case, uh, uh, why, why you were mentioning the, the connection between uh, sexism and racism, uh, in that case, uh, the point was really limiting, uh, um, according to them, what was the uh, things done by uh, Roma people and people also from minorities uh, that are seen in Hungary as, uh, as different, as dangerous, uh, and of course always connected to the class cleavage. I don't know, what I wanted to ask is, do you think there could be connection like that, there could be also some trends that maybe go outside uh, Brazil, also the United States has a uh, uh, policy, policy of securitization of uh, schools that is quite special, and uh, yeah, that's it, thank you. Sorry, Martha, I didn't hear you. Did you hear the question? Yeah, I guess I did. Can you say? Uh, can you have the name of the questionnaire? What's your name? Giuseppe. 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 Are we taking more questions or answering yeah. each? Okay, we're taking more questions, yes. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Giuseppe. Yeah, 
much on your components uh, on those deals. Because I was quite, I was surprised when I heard you say that, uh, how little emphasis has been put on teachers as laborers. And, I, and it made me, I come from Peru, uh, and it made me think about some of the discussions that we have had um, over the last what, three decades um, in the country. And one of the things that has happened with, with in, in our case of teacher reform is that the teachers union, um, which has been declared or described as a very conservative teachers union, even by um, leftist activists, uh, is a teachers union that is almost solely focused on the issue of teachers as laborers. Uh, and so it, there, there has been a strong question about uh, trying to bring teachers into a conversation about students and, what, and, and the idea of teaching as service uh, for students. Um, and so I was, I was uh, puzzled by that, and I don't know how, how, how you would react to that. Maybe it's a different context, uh, but, but I thought it was interesting. Yes, Jennifer. Mission go into sorry okay. and this messed up some time here in the computer. <laughs> uh, Steffi, thank you for your question and I found it very interesting because one of the reasons of was bringing this type of work to the, the conference is just to be able to understand what is comparable in other contexts around the world and uh, with what we are experiencing and researching in our own, our own. So, yeah, I would say I can perceive some comparable trends in the sense of securitization, although I don't have like this profound knowledge of your context or, or of this thing at all, because we just started to dive in, into the militarization here in Brazil and Latin America to discuss this topic here. And I've come from a, a long path of, of studying feminism and anti-gender agenda in education. I just finished my doctorate. Mm -hmm. So I don't have this broad knowledge to make bigger comparisons. But yeah, what I can say is that the anti-gender agenda has been uh, observed as a transnational movement in many, many places. We did observe that. Uh, so far in the United States and of course in Hungary too, but I didn't research that so uh, more profoundly. But I know it has been happening also in Ghana and also in the UK as well. Uh, but yeah, I think that securitization or militarization of schools is a really powerful and effective strategy to ex uh, to exerts control over students, but also over a societal project. So we have this conservative move, movement that is growing so fast in so many places in the globe, and I see that this type of authoritarian policies is a great way of stopping this societal projects of diversity to evolve. And uh, I do see some similarities and that's such a shame and that's a nerve for us to research and to do work on that and to talk about it and I really thank you for sharing that with me and yeah I think that's what I have to say so thank you. Also in the case for, of the teacher union, which is well, not really a union as some students you know, but it works as a union sometimes, um, there has been also a strong critique that they have been a focus, they have focused too long in their working conditions, like in improving salaries, so I think it's kind of that, right? 
improving their salaries, uh, improving um, yeah, like incentives to work, and not necessarily connected to a pedagogical project or with some limitations to it. And about that, I have to say that, and, and you, you people that study like labor and teachers for a long time know more about this, but there has been <laughs> there has been a project of that teachers in Latin America have been uh, have become much more precarious, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, and maybe that can explain why they have been rightfully focused on that. Uh, but the fact that they have been trying to secure some of the working conditions don't necessarily means that even themselves or researchers have been seeing these larger circuits of labor, which include social reproduction uh, and the many tasks they can perform, even not just with the students, but with themselves. Right? So, for instance, if we think about social reproductive spheres of teachers as workers themselves, we can also think about their uh, collective uh, organization, like right? how they create collaboration, like solidarity in their workplaces. And that is also a labor uh, angle. Yes, I first of all like congratulations for the fantastic panel. Um, uh, my question is for uh, Maffer, Maria Fernanda. Um, when you said that uh, you were trying to find uh, additional lenses for analyzing privatization, uh, if you could uh, further elaborate a little bit more why the, this idea of enclosure was uh, useful for your analysis and also saying that uh, it's, it's fantastic to bring uh, these lenses into the privatization, particularly like intersectional lenses, because that's a huge blank space in the in the literature about the topic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. First, awesome. Congratulations, awesome panels. So you all were not only using intersectional feminism, but various other theories integrated with intersectional feminism. They're clearly, clearly all brilliant. Um, my question is more towards this question of unions and how the kind of organizing dynamics of the countries are shaping what you are all talking about, um, mostly for Chile and Peru. So like in your case, Rocio, you also study sort of the dissident teacher movement. Um, and so how does, like, are, does the dissident teacher movement, have, do they have a different vision of teachers as laborers? Is there, like, is, is there something we can learn from the dissident movement in terms of what you're talking about? And maybe this is, I'm sure this is like the most complicated question ever. But in Peru, it is really interesting that, as problematic as it might have been, that a teacher union leader was president for a brief period. And did that shift any dynamics among the public-private relationship or, or anything? Yeah. yeah. and how this is also intersected by race, uh, class, ethnicity. In the case of like Peru, it's very clear, also in Chile, how uh, private schools are not only spaces that are um, marketized, like in the market economy, but are also in close communities that are um, more homogeneous within and heterogeneous from each other, right? Which is like the whole notion of segregation at the end. And I feel that understanding those, um, how those relations are um, fragmented, reorganized um, through like this um, this educational landscape can help us see like other ways in which the market can build on that to also profit. It's like not it's not that it's, that's not happening, right? But it's intersected with like um, yeah with these other other elements uh, that are part of it. So yeah, I hope that's clear enough. I think I'm still thinking about it in my mind. So. And I'm still working on like interviewing. So like right now, for example, I really want to talk to people that are involved in the current landscape. I try to, to, to see if they are, for example, like for example, I want to talk to people in private um, private providers or people that are very much involved in private governance of education. Uh, how they see if they have a public role and in, in like in private education and what are the limits of that? Because a lot of the emphasis that the state has put on private providers is that they broaden access, right? But there is no discussion on how this is linked to equity or equality or other public purposes beyond that. And I think that's a limitation that 
we need to see regarding how we understand what is public and what is private in these spheres, right? And yes, uh, so these, like the election, uh, for everyone else, if, in case you don't know, like we recently had a former um, teacher and a union, union um, how do you say, member union, union leader elected as president of the country. And actually, like the teacher profession in Peru, I guess like similar to it, has been very linked to politics. Like in certain like communities and indigenous communities, sometimes the teacher is the only representative of the state, right? Like or like a state institution, very much linked to academic power and like cultural representation of it. So like in this case, um, there has been like a whole destabilization of like the country, like for larger um, economic, political, social crisis. And this president that was supposed to bring like the teacher, um, for like teacher the teachers' demands um, um, couldn't couldn't actually reach that. And also those teachers' demands are very much politicized uh, with like and different fragments of the teachers, teacher unions and like non unionized teachers. And there's like a, a, a like a massive like. Um, divide between like the teacher reforms that are happening in the country and how teachers actually are feeling with these reforms. There's something there that needs to be understood on like how these changes that are made from like the state thinking about meritocracy or like teachers not actually like also teach, seeing teaching as labor or like maybe like something is missing there. It's clashing with like a large population of teachers that has been having precarized and having like largely precarious and not accompanied by the state either. So I think those are, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. So I think it's, it does differ in teacher movement in Chile has different approach to labor, right? And I think that the short answer would be yes. Especially from uh, feminist um, grassroots organizations within teachers. However, and I think it's also important to say that even though there are different approaches that are kind of emerging or re-emerging because they were present somehow before, this is still very difficult. This is what I um, observe kind of with a, with a foot in the research, when I put working with them. Like, I mean, I'm not sure how um, how much entitled I am. That's what I'm saying. But uh, how much entitled I am to say, yes, this is a good strategy, or yes, they are not seeing the work, blah, blah, blah. But I will try to go put the effort or like to dare to do that. Um, because Maybe even if we think about our own work, whatever work we do as researchers, academics, teaching assistants, it's also difficult to see these circuits, right? Um, Professor Michael was saying this the other day, like, we need collectivization, we need these sort of reflective spaces to understand what's actually going on when I, I don't know, like when, when I perform the work I do, and I think that for teachers and organizations in Chile, this has also been the case. So even though there are, some um, good attempts and projects to see different aspects of teaching is still very difficult uh, to understand what's happening, like what's taking place. And possibly because in Chile, the education policies are so messy, and, and uh, there are so many that for everyone, for researchers and even more for teachers, it's so hard to keep up with what's going on, right? So on the one hand, we have this uh, policy on safe classroom, which is supposed to brainstorm, and this goes back to um, Bruna's work, to brainstorm the principle of, of authority in teachers. So maybe that will sound very good for some teachers because they, give, they do value their social status. However, um, this is actually kind of trying to control student activism, right? That is, to some extent, could also help them to uh, liberate themselves from some oppressions. So it's, it's about the difficulties of uh, the overlapping, the contradictions, because policy is not uh, straightforward. There, there are also contradictions between poli and, um, within the policy domain. And I hope I answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so we're running out of time. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for listening to us. Uh, thank you, Lila. Mm -hmm. um,